Brian! You've got to come see this! It's the registration for the Elmwood Royals football camp! You always wanted to be an Elmwood Royal, and you've always wanted to play football! This is your chance! Wow. Mom was a little more excited than I was. <laughs> but I was excited. I got to go play football with the Elmwood Royals. I got to wear a special shirt. I got to grab the laces of the football and feel how you make it throw, make it uh, spiral. And then you got to go and hit other people and Mom couldn't yell at me. <laughs> that was the best. Well, as a 10-year-old as a boy in 1977, that makes me 53. I'd be in the front yard while my dad and brothers were on their tractors going out in the fields. So I'd be in the front yard taking the hike for the virtual center. I'd be, oh, this is a nerve football. My wife wouldn't let me have a real football in the house. You can understand. Anyway, so I'd be hike, taking the hike for the virtual center. And I'd be, hot one, hot two, hike. And then hike the ball to myself. And then I'd hand the ball off to myself. Or if I really wanted to switch it up, I would throw the ball to myself. Oddly enough, I usually scored. <laughs> Football was everything to me. Having seven older brothers, I got to watch them play quite often. When I got to watch them play, we'd come back home and we'd come back to our room and, well, my brother and I, we shared a bedroom. Not only that, we shared a bed. But on the, on the bed, of the, on the uh, wall of our bedroom, was this poster of Bart Starr. One of those posters that we got out of the cereal box. Do you remember when you got things out of the cereal box? Weren't those the good old days? Well, anyways, in the front yard, I pretend to be Bart Starr, or Fran Tarkenton, or Terry Bradshaw. Those are who I wanted to be someday. There was no question for me. I wanted to be on that poster in the show box. Well, day one of football camp came, and it couldn't come soon enough. So we're, day one of football camp, we're working on our conditioning. So we're running, we're running, we're running, we're running. That was our conditioning. I don't think the coach had anything else for us to do that day. But anyway, towards the end of the day, I had a little bit of a headache, and I was tired. But I was getting kind of tired. Day two of camp came, and we were working on blocking and tackling. So we were down in our three-point stands. And it was hot one, hot two, hike. And they'd hike the ball. And then we get up and you, when they hike it, you'd pop the other guy on the other side of the line. Man, it was awesome. We were with other football players, getting to do what we wanted to do. It was great. Well, the end of that day came, and I had a little bit more of a headache, but I was tired again, but getting kind of tired. Day three of the camp came. I don't, I don't even remember what we worked on. I was blindsided. I don't know why I remember just laying on the couch at the end of the day, and I got to use the restroom. And when I did, that's the last thing I remember. The next thing I remember, I was having stitches put into my chin. My mom had taken me from hospital to hospital to hospital, trying to find out what was wrong with her baby boy. From there at the Medical College of Ohio, they determined that I had hydrocephalus. That's, that's cephalus, not syphilis. I was 10. <laughs> anyway, so I went and had surgery, and in the surgery, what they did is they put a shot in my brain, well, drains the flu excess cranial fluid from my brain, my skull, to my abdomen. That's what a hydrocephalus is. It's a shot I still have, I have until this day. Well, after a few days, the doctor came in, and he said, Mr. Wagner, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm ready to get back to football. When can I get back to football camp? Uh, Mr. Wagner, I'm sorry, but your football career is over. Over? How, how could it be over? It hasn't even started yet. Over? I couldn't believe it. There was nothing that I could do to change it. Well, the only thing I could do was join the football team as soon as I could, as the water boy. So I became the water boy for the Signet Royals. 
They were a feeder team for the Elmer Royals. But the doctor said to me, he said, Son, you just need to go live your life. So that's what I did. I just went and lived my life. A few days after that, after that meeting with the doctor, they, I went to my grandma's house. And at grandma's, I walked in and, you know, I had a long face, I'm sure. But uh, grandma looked at me and she said, Brian, what's wrong? Now I laid my sob story on her about how I wasn't able to play football anymore, yada, yada, yada. And she's like, Brian, life's not going to turn out the way you planned. So don't be afraid to reimagine your life. Find what makes you unique and find a way to use that to make someone else's life better. So that's what I've done ever since then. It's been looking for a way of what makes me unique. So, I gotta ask, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you want to be on that poster? Tell me in the chat box. This is a little interactive here, so we're gonna talk a little bit. If you would, let me know what you wanted to be when you grew up. I'll give you about 30 seconds and then we're gonna move on. Uh, oh wow, all kinds coming in. Very cool. Very cool. Pharmacist, lawyer, doctor, baker, a nurse, track star. Wow. Isn't that awesome how all those memories come back? That's incredible. I love it. I absolutely love it. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. While you're doing that, I'm going to make things look a little differently here. A veterinarian? Awesome. Wow. I so appreciate the interaction. It's not all always that we get this level of interaction. And this is so good because this is a great way to start your day. And a great way to start the other panelists' day as well. Because now they're going to see there's going to be a lot of interaction. So, oh, Broadway star? Wow. It <laughs> changed my mind. Paleontologist, teacher, and then a dancer. Wow, that's incredible. Baseball player and paleontologist. That sounds like my oldest son. Huh, interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to go on from here, but keep, keep on. If you have, if you have other thoughts, please let me know what they are. So this is the point of the presentation where I have to tell you that this is not a sob story about the stuff I've gone through, and I, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I certainly don't want that. But it's really about what sets you apart, because we all have something that makes us unique. What is it for you? I want to encourage you over the next 35, 45 minutes to, well, I guess 60 minutes or more, think about what makes you unique. What sets you apart? And we're going to come back to that here in a minute. Fast forward to March 4th of 2011. Uh, the day before, I'd been in a training session in Cleveland, Ohio, about two hours north of where I live. And uh, I came back home at the end of the day, and it was late. My eyes had started to bother me at the end of the day. Up until then, I had two good eyes, just like most of you. I got home, and it was late. My wife had already gone, and the kids had already gone to bed, so I just walked in and I laid on the couch. Now about 3 a.m. I woke up. And when you wake up at 3 a.m. and you're over 40, there's really only one place you need to go. So as I'm walking, I'm I'm stumbling, I'm hitting things, I'm knocking and stuff. I'm like, what the heck? Did Connie revert you again? I didn't know what was going on. Now everything seemed to be quite dark, darker than normal. Once I made it to the restroom, I walked in and I went to flip on the light switch. Nothing seemed to happen. When I looked towards the mirror, I could see that there was a slit, some lights of slits coming out of the bottom of my eyes. 
when I looked at the mirror, uh, there was nothing I could see unless I did this, unless I lifted one eye with my hand. My eyes were swollen shut. At least I saw they were just swollen shut. But my eyelids didn't work at all. There was nothing I could do to open them. Well, Connie heard the commotion and she came downstairs. Brian! What happened? What happened? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. This is where we determined that I was blind and there was nothing that I could do to get my sight back. That was the scariest moment of my life. As soon as we were able to, we went off to the emergency room. And there at the emergency room, they took this picture and they showed it to me. And the doctor came in and he said, Mr. Wagner, it appears as though the cavernous malformation in your brain stem is bled. A cavernous malformation, or a cav mal, if you will, it's a malformed blood vessel. They can form anywhere, anywhere in your body. Mine just happened to have formed in my brain stem. It appears the cav mal has bled, and it's putting pressure on the nerves to control your vision. We're recommending that you have brain surgery. Brain surgery? Wait a minute! They told me not to let someone out there on my brainstem! What's changed? The problems you have are only, going, are only going to become worse and more frequent. Worse and more frequent. Worse and more frequent. Those are the words that I heard for the next 27 days. But they said, we have one doctor, there's one subject matter expert that we recommend you go and see. He's in Phoenix. So that's what I did. Do you remember in your life when you had just one? There was just one subject matter expert, there was just one teacher, one coach, one friend, one spouse, whatever it is. There was just one person that was there for you that helped you get out of a certain situation you were in and get you to the next level. Well, this doctor was mine. So I flew to Phoenix, Arizona. Then the next day, I had brain surgery. Really. I met the doctor one day, had brain surgery the next. That, later that afternoon, after having brain surgery, I was walking the hall. And the next morning, 24 hours after having brain surgery, I was discharged with a little bottle of extra strength Tylenol. They sent me back home. And there, I was still blind. But I was blind, and I realized that, you know, when you're blind, you, you can't do anything. You, you just go through a hard time. Because it's humbling, really, when you have to sit on your front porch and wait for a ride from a colleague. It's awkward when you walk into the wrong restroom and use it. It's frustrating when your wife really does move the furniture. During that time, though, I made a deal. I made a deal with God. Haven't we, haven't we all done that at times? We have made a deal with God. You know, God, if I can get my sight back, I just want to be able to help other people. I, I, I'll dedicate my life to helping other people. And that was the deal I made. Well, I didn't get all my sight back. But what I got instead was vision. My vision is to be able to help other people. I'm here to help other people. That's what I do. That's why I'm here. Why are you here? I'm willing to bet you you're the same as me. It's to help other people. You help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But there's more to that. You help a lot of people with just understanding what this, this 
whole community is about. They're not separate. They're all part of us. They're all one. We're all one. Well, there was an encourager that I had as I was going through life, going through my state of blindness. And uh, this encourager was my wife, Connie. She, uh, she took me out and wanted to have me go for walks. You know, I, hadn't, I had no idea what she said when she was going for a walk. I mean, she was really wanting to go for an exercise walk, not a walk walk, not a romance walk. Uh, but I had no idea she was going to take me down such treacherous terrain. I mean, look at this. This sidewalk. There's legs on the left, and there's legs on the right. And eventually there's going to be people coming from in front of us. What do we do then? And people coming from behind. But more than that, there's those undulations. Undulations. <laughs> Isn't that a fun word? It's one of those $20 words. But those undulations change when I walk down the sidewalk the opposite way. My whole perspective changed. What I got out of life changed. I want to encourage you to think about that same thing from your perspective. If you change your perspective, maybe you take your client's perspective or the, or the person you're serving, the person you're taking care of, whatever it is you're, you're, you're with every day. Take their perspective. And I'm sure you do this already. But having their perspective makes all the difference in the world. So tell me, who is your biggest encourager? Who was your biggest encourager growing up? Growing up, in your career, whatever you want to tell me about. I I'm happy to hear about it. So, again, in your chat box, please let me know. We're going to take another 60 seconds for this, and we will get started. Who was your biggest encourager? Family, granny, daddy, granddad, parents, mama, mom? Grandparents. Awesome. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, this is great. Wow. Pastor. Okay, cool. My grandmother. Keep them coming. I love this. Huh. Karina's was Mrs. Cooper. Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe that one is the client you're serving. Maybe. I don't know. A high school teacher and my mom. Awesome. 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 We still got about 10 seconds left, so keep them coming. And then we're going to get back started. Family, Gene Edwards. All right. Well, thank you so much, and keep them coming uh, for that. I really appreciate you doing that. I had another encourager as, as I was uh, blind. In, uh, for Father's Day of that year, uh, my daughter gave me a Father's Day card. It's pretty special. She was 13 at the time. I'd like to share it with you. Dear Dad, Happy Dad's Day. I hope you have a great day because you definitely deserve it. All the cards and TV commercials always say, my dad's the best. But they're all lying. Sure, other people's dads are great. They're younger than you. And they're sportier. And they're funner. But you've got something that they don't have. Bravery. Even after everything you've been through, you still got out of bed in the morning. You still joke around. You still go out and play with us and cook on the grill even though you only have half of one good eye. But you do more still. You teach me that even though you go through the most toughest, most grueling things, that if you just believe, believe that God is right there with you through everything, 
believe that everything turns out okay in the end. And you make it out alive. Not always unscathed, but alive. And giving me that hope, that sense of belief, well, I'd take that over a dad with two good eyes any day. Love, 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 Jess. When's the last time you received a letter like that? I got a better question. When is the last time you wrote a letter like that? You remember that one we were talking about earlier? I want you to write them a letter right now. Remember how Jess put it. You don't have to put your letter the same way, but I want you to write the letter. For real, right now. Jeff said, sure, other people's dads are great. Stop comparing yourself to other people. For one, dad, other people's dads are great. They're younger than you, they're spoiler, and they're funner. But you've got something that they don't have. Tell that person what they have. Dad, you still got out of bed in the morning. You still do what? What, what does your person do? How do they help you? And then she told me about my faith. Now, we all have different faiths. We all have different walks with spirituality. Tell that person what they meant to you at that time. How did they help you to remind you of your faith? We're going to take three minutes, and we're going to write that letter. Thank you. And I will keep watch of the clock here. Three minutes. Yes, I am. Very lucky man, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you for noticing.
Well, we have for time. We got 20 seconds left. And if you didn't finish, that's okay. You can come back to it. You can come back to it and uh, continue to work on it. I just want to make sure you, you get the letter sent out today. Because if you don't get it sent out today, it won't get sent out. So get it sent out today. We have about five seconds left. All right. All right, all right, all right. Let's see here. I get this question all the time. People ask me, Brian, how do you stay so positive? You were a two-second guy, a two-eyed guy, and now you went down to one eye, and you, it doesn't matter. You, you seem to be so much more positive than you were before. How do you do it? Well, I'll tell you how I do it. There are some very, very prescriptive ways that I do it to stay positive. I have to be that way. Because I want to serve other people. I want to have, make other people's lives better. So being positive is something that's crucial for me. First thing I do, I don't watch the news. Now, I, I do watch the evening news sometimes. But I do everything I can to stay away from the morning news. That's a hard part. Of, it's a hard thing to do at times. Because I used to be the guy that came downstairs and I would flick on the news. That would be what I, I would be in the background, whatever. I mean, I don't know. I just listen to it. I would either say, well, I need to watch the news because you know, I want to learn about the weather. I can get that on my phone now. Uh, I, I, I want to watch the news because uh, when I want to hear about sports. Well, I can get that on my phone too. Um, and then, you know, the other stuff that you get on the news, you get shootings and deaths and negatives, negativity I and mean, politics. Oh my gosh. Um, lots of politics, and that's not what I want to hear first thing in the morning. I want to hear good news. I want to wake up with my wife, and I want to be able to talk with her and talk about joyous things. I want to think, talk about what, those kind of things that bring me joy. And that's the second thing, is to find, what, find and focus on what brings me joy. If I can do that, then that makes all the difference in the world. A friend of mine actually came into town just a, uh, a few months ago. And she said, Brian, how do you do it? And she said, well, how I do it, I focus on what brings me joy. So she told me about this letter that she actually wrote out. She wrote down the things that bring her joy, one by one. So, you know, I think of how important it is to, for me to know, and this probably sounds inappropriate at the time when we're talking about all the, uh, all the fires in Oregon, but I like to go and sit outside and out my at my uh, patio, and I built a, a little uh, fire pit fire, and it's, you know, it's all contained, so um, it's not dangerous. But that's one of the things that brings me joy is looking at a fire. Uh, I also think about the the joy that I get from talking about my dad. My dad died about five and a half years ago, but I love to talk about him because everybody that knows him or knew of him really has so many good things to say and they always compliment me on my smile they say they say that i have a wagner smile i'm not sure what that is but that's what i have talking about my dad brings me joy I'm taking a nap <laughs> and that brings me joy uh, that's not what i'm going to do today in between our session but it, it is one of those things that brings me joy so that's an important thing for me is to focus on what brings me joy. But the other thing that really helps me to stay positive is to call somebody else for them. Not that I want to tell them my sob story. I don't want to tell them how bad things are going. I don't even want to tell them how good things are going. I want to talk to them for them. See how they're doing. We all have heard of how important that is, and it's really important. I'm sure you do this quite a lot with the different people that you serve. But then there's also this self-awareness tool that helps with my positivity. You know, it helps me to understand that I have blind spots. This self-awareness tool is called the Johari Window. And the Johari Window is a tool created in 1955 by two British psychologists. Their names happen to have been Joe and Harry. Now, thank goodness Harry didn't get top billing because that would have been weird. But the Joe Harry window has become the first thing that I ever learned about from a self-awareness perspective. And we can all learn from it. 
because the tool, the tool, I'll just tell you, the tool looks like this. So you have things that are known to others and things that are unknown to others. And then on the x-axis, you have things that are known to you and things that are unknown to you. If you look at this window and think about how things that are known to others and things that are known to you, it's really the, the best area you want to be in. That's really when it, where you have your, your peak performance, your peak presence. You are the most awesome that you can be is when you're up there. So, for example, there are characteristics that you can put into this window, and you can even use it for a performance review if you'd like. So, in the, in the Johar window, you can look at these characteristics. So, here's a number of them that we have. There's many, many more, but these are the characteristics that I think of when I think about how I'm going to look at the Jari window and where I fall in there. So, again, to go back, you know, we have that unknown area where we have unknown and un unknown, unknown to us and unknown to others. Well, that's really the hidden area. We don't know what's there. We don't know what's going on. It's unknown. But then off to the right, we have the other area, and that's really another hidden area. The hidden area that we talk about there is where we have things that, you know, we may have in our characteristics that we don't tell anybody about. Maybe you know, we've gotten a, uh, a degree in accounting, and we just haven't shared that with the rest of our team. Well, wouldn't it be kind of nice to let the rest of the team know that? Wouldn't it be helpful for them to know? Maybe there's different things going on, on with us at home, and to let them know would be helpful as well. Now, it's the vulnerable part of this, is to help them to understand who you are. What, in, in, what incentives do you have? All that to understand, and this may be as a manager or as a, a team member, you know, you may also want to make sure that the rest of the team knows. And then there's also the, uh, the area in the top left corner. And that's the, the spot where you have things that are known to others, but they're unknown to you. That is your blind spot. We all have blind spots. We all have blindness in our lives. Now, talk, look back on that, le that letter you wrote, the letter that, I, that Jess wrote me. I mean, she told me that I had blind spots. She told me to stop comparing myself to other people. But she also told me I had another blind spot, that I was her dad, and I was adding so much value to her that I didn't even know it. And it was a huge blind spot that I had. And it, as I began to uncover that, it made that one area, that black area, smaller. That's what this is all about, is to be able to help you make these areas get smaller and, well, that peak presence area get bigger. So that, again, like I said, the peak presence in the upper right, and then the blind spot on the left, unknown in the lower left, and then hidden area in the lower right. If you look at this, to get to a point where you have a better peak, pre peak presence area, that peak performance, you want to have feedback. And any time you have feedback, well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But feedback is very important, and that will make your blind spot smaller. And there's another way that you can make your hidden area and your unknown areas. Um, well, we're going to talk about feedback. But feedback is to make sure that you get it from a trusted advisor, a trusted relationship, a truth teller, if you will. If you can do that, then you're going to get more valuable, more valuable information back. Invest in other people. If you invest in other people, then they're going to be more likely to invest in you, more likely to give you good feedback if you ask for it. Then when you get feedback, you ask, you ask for specific feedback. You ask from a specific person, and then you ask for it in a timely manner. But then you have to make appropriate changes. That's important. And give good feedback. And giving good feedback is much like we just talked about with investing in other people. Ask curious questions and listen to the answers. Those are very important for us all to understand. Not, we don't always take that feedback. We don't always use that feedback. But taking it in and understanding you know, that piece of feedback is a good piece of feedback. But more than that, just to understand that feedback is a gift. And what do you say when you receive a gift? Thank you. That's right. Now, the vulnerability I said I've talked about here in a minute. This is where you know you want to make sure that you know, the rest of your team knows some of the stuff about you. You know, maybe your incentives. 
Maybe what your motives are. Maybe um, things going on at home. All of that to help and understand you a little bit better. And that's going to make your peak presence area better, bigger. And then you're going to become more awesome. Because the more awesome you are, the better the chances are that you're going to start to know it. And that's important. So how do you be awesome? Know yourself. Know who you are. It's taken me a long time to get to this point where I now understand who I am. I know I'm here to give other people hope. Hope and inspiration. But who are you? Who are you? Where do you line up in that drawing window? Build on your strengths. You know, we talk a lot about, in performance reviews, we talk about a lot about the good things you're doing and the not so good things you're doing and the areas you can work on and the other areas you can work, you're doing well. Well, those are two strong areas. So I would encourage you to take a different look at that. Instead of focusing on that one area you should be working on, what if you focus on the areas you're already good at? And had someone else on your team fill in that spot that is where you're not as good. That's going to allow your team to get much, much better, much, much quicker if you focus on those strength areas. So I encourage you to look at things that way. And then talk nicely to yourself. There are too many times, too many of us, that we talk nicely, talk, talk nicely to ourselves. See, we say things like, oh, you're so dumb. Why, why did you do that? I can't believe you made that mistake. What a fool. Stop it. Stop talking that way. It's not helpful. It's not funny. Stop talking nice, talk nice, start talking nice things. Stop talking mean. But the final way to be awesome is to share your awesomeness with other people. That's going to make all the difference in the world. Once you start to share it, then everything gets better. Better for everybody. Much like in that letter that you just wrote to that person. That's awesome. That letter is going to change that person's life. But you know what's more than that? It's going to change your life. Your life is going to change forever when you deliver that letter. Because then you're going to become an encourager. An encourager that encourages other people. An encourager of encouragers. And it's going to be a big, big lift to everybody. So tell me in the chat box, who is ready to share your awesomeness with the world? I'm going to give you just a few seconds for you here to respond. You don't have to if you don't want to. I get it. But we all need to share our awesomeness with the entire world. All right, all right, all right. Very cool. I'm glad to hear that you're out there. This is great. I'm so glad to hear that. Absolutely. Very cool. <sighs> that makes me happy. Repeat after me. Repeat after me. I am awesome. Now, this is a weird part because you're maybe in the middle of an office. You may be in your home where you're, you're your spouse or your best together or your friend or whoever is in the bed. Maybe they're still trying to sleep. I don't know. But yell this at the top of your lungs. I am awesome. And I will share it. One more time. I am awesome. And I will share it. Nice job. Nice job. Thank you so much. That's great. Oh, I'm just so happy. I'm just so happy. This is cool. Ah, well, all of this has led up, led up to a point where I started to have more self-awareness. And I'm trying to talk about blind spots. How important it is for us to know what a blind spot is. Well, let's first talk about what a blind spot is. A blind spot, if you're driving, a blind spot is that area over your right right, uh, right shoulder. Now, if, I'm, if I have somebody that's riding with me, we have an arrangement, and they will see my blind spot. They will see what I don't see. Who do you have that sees your blind spot? Who do you have that sees what you don't see? Now, again, this is going from a physical blind spot to a mental, spiritual maybe, blind spot. So think about that. Now, many of you will say, well, my spouse sees my blind spot. And maybe that's true. But 
you're at your work, most likely you don't have a spouse that sees your blind spots. What are your blind spots that your coworkers see? Who helps you to notice them? Who helps you identify them? That's important, an important aspect of this. Now, there's also leadership blind spots. <laughs> you're scaring the neighbors. <laughs> Nice, Micah. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, but we have the, in leaders. We all have blind spots, and leaders have blind spots as well. You know, we talk a lot about blind spots in our leadership uh, curriculum, where we're talking. This is part of the uh, Wink University. So in this curriculum, we talk about going alone. How that's a big blind spot, um, and it's it's a blind spot because. For one, you're not taking people along with you that could help you in the future. Maybe they could lead that project or whatever you're working on. Maybe they could lead that going in the future. But also, you're not taking into consideration the thoughts and ideas of so many other people. So that's why that's definitely a blind spot. Lacking appreciation. There are so many people that say, managers for one, that say, well, I pay them. That's how I show them appreciation. Well, that, my friend, is a, is a blind spot because that is the table stakes. You want to be able to show appreciation. You want to say please and thank you at a bare minimum. Just be kind. And I tell you, I've been working with the, the folks with, uh, that support those with intellectual and developmental disabilities for the last few years, and there's no question that all of you show appreciation, and I appreciate all of you, but leaders sometimes need to be reminded of that blind spot. We're not being teachable is another leadership blind spot. They, they will say things like, oh, I know, I know, I know, I, I got this one, I know. Well, not being teachable, not understanding that there's always something else to learn. There's always something else to learn is a blind spot. So we need to understand that as well. And then not showing consideration, not being considered of others. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes we forget that, you know, Somebody may have a, a kid's soccer game at 5.30, or, or maybe they have a desk point they need to get to that day. Now, scheduling a meeting or a, a meeting at 4.30 probably isn't the best idea to show consideration. That's why we consider that a blind spot. The definition of leadership. The definition of leadership comes from John Maxwell. Uh, I'm a John Maxwell certified coach, and in this definition of leadership, he makes it very, very simple. Leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. So there's a few quotes that John has that he has uh, written down, and we applied them to the, to the leadership blind spots. And I would say that one of those is uh, the leaders who value their employees, give them their, what do you think? Leaders who value their employees, give them their least effort? No, I don't think that's right. Even their, their best effort. Another one. And you can have a copy of these slides as well afterwards. But leaders who value their employees like their employees. Leaders who value their employees want to be served by their employees? That doesn't sound right. Leaders who value their, leaders who value their employees serve their employees. That's, that's what it's all about, is service. No matter what, what role you're in, you know, if you're the CEO, you still serve the board. The board still serves someone. They, they serve the other groups. But, I mean, that's important for us all to know that we are all in a service, should be in a service mentality. Leaders who value their employees, like them. Manipulate them? Nah, that doesn't sound right to me. Leaders who value their employees, empower them. Make them more responsible and have more empowerment, disempower. That's important for us all to understand. Now, the blind spots that we all had going into um, COVID-19 back in, I guess it would have been March, um, <laughs> were incredible. So today, our blind spots are a little bit different. Back early on, there were many, many blind spots that we had. And still, they're there. The scarcity mentality. I don't know why it is, but when I go to the grocery store, I still have instances where there are certain items that I just can't find. You know, if it's um, Gatorade or maybe cornstarch, strange things that make no sense, 
but they're still in a scarcity mentality because people see them, I may, I'm, I'm supposing, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing people see that there's only a few of those items left and they take them. Whether they need them or not, I, I, I think that they just take them because of that scarcity mentality. And then there's also the crowd mentality. You know, we're going with the herd. I remember when, uh, back in March, <clears throat> when this first started, my wife called me and she said, hey, the governor is going to come on and he's going to probably shut everything down. I'm like, really? Shut everything down? What's that mean? He can't do that. <laughs> ah, guess he can. <laughs> well, she said, go to Kroger, the grocery store, and pick us up some uh, flour and something else. I'm like, okay. So I went and, oh my gosh, Kroger was packed with different people trying to do the same thing that I was. It was that crowd mentality that really got us to that scarcity perspective. But then there's our calendars. Our calendars is not a negative thing. Our calendars have freed up. I now am well, I'm able to stay here in my office in Columbus, Ohio with all of my different tools and uh, luxury at my hand and I'm able to have dinner with my wife. I'm able to have dinner with my family quite often. Whereas normally I would not have had that opportunity. I'm able to share a bed with her every night because I don't go anywhere. It's a nice thing. It's a very nice thing. Now there's a, an igniter that helped me back in 2011, 2013. His name was Kerry. Kerry helped me to understand that I had a great message to carry to other people. I had, I had a good heart. I, he encouraged me to you know, do something with my, my story. But he said, first of all, make sure that you don't quit your day job. So I went from job to job to job. And I, I just, again, I, I had a blind spot. But I wanted to make sure that I got back to this. So this is what I do. And now I've created this own company of mine. And it's called a Radical Vision. And there are many, many people that have joined me as well. So now Wes, that you see online, he'll be there to help out with whatever it is that we need help with. And I encourage people all over, all over the country to embrace their own personal blindness to achieve a greater vision for their lives. That's what we do. And we do that by taking people from a point of blindness to sight, to vision. Again, blindness to sight, to vision. As I was telling you, I was still working at a job and I had, uh, I was in IT sales at the time. Now, in IT sales, typically you have a sales guy, and then you have a, a smart guy along with a typical sales call. So on this one sales call, we went in, and I walked up to the guard shack, and I told the lady my name, and uh, she says, well, she started to make me out a name tag. And she bent down, and she started to write it out. She said, uh, how do you spell that? And she didn't look her head up at all. And I said, well, my name's Brian, with one eye. <laughs> I didn't think it was that funny at the time, but smart guy here, <laughs> I thought he was going to pee his pants. <laughs> so, coming home from that call, I'm driving my car and I'm like, that's who I am. I'm Brian, with one eye. What has changed for you in your world? that you need to accept. You need to get over something. There's something hanging out there. But if you accept that, then you can, like I've done, I went from blindness to sight to vision. Well, when I, when I was blind, I was so blind. But when I had sight, I needed to have an awareness. And I did that with the drawing window. But you know, the other part of the uh, uh, being sight was, you know, I, I had to accept my situation. I had to accept who I was. And that's really where this happens. So when do you need to accept? Because once you accept that, then you can go on to the next step. And that next step is having vision. And vision is really what it's all about. You know, there's a, a great man that I knew once. His name, <laughs> I'm going to tell you his name in a minute, but he was my dad. And my dad had great vision. He knew so much about living a good life, and enjoying the relationships that he had with other people. 
you know, I'm a big relationship guy myself, and I like to have fun, much like my dad liked to have fun. Well, anywhere we'd go, we'd have a big smile on our face. Mm -hmm. It was that Wagner smile. See that? Anyway, so my dad, we'd have a good time, or at least we'd have a smile on our face no matter where we'd go, whether we were at, at church or a birthday party or, or even a funeral. I'll never forget the time my dad bought the farm. Well, I, I, I didn't mean he bought the farm. He, he bought a farm. So he, one, one of these days, uh, it was a, maybe a Saturday, I think, he went to town and uh, you know, went to the lawyer's office where they were having a silent auction. And uh, he submitted a bid and waited to hear about it. And finally, they came back out. And sure enough, he had won. So all the other farmers that were there to bid on it, they just went away, went away hanging their heads. I mean, there was nothing they could do because my dad bid so much on this ground. But he had oblivious optimism. He has oblivious optimism to be able to help other people. He, he had oblivious optimism to grow good crops on that ground, to have great relationships with everybody. He, that's just who he was. So that, I think I'd get a little bit of that from my dad, that oblivious optimism. My wife one time said to me, because she had seen me hanging my head, she said, where's my Brian? Where's my Brian with oblivious optimism? Well, I never liked the word oblivious optimism. <laughs> I really call it uh, unbridled optimism. That to me sounds better. But my oblivious optimism is what I have. and It's what my dad had. Well, my dad came home from that sale and he was all excited. But then he realized he had to go in and tell Mary Jo, my mom. <laughs> this uh, story of what he bought. And it was uh, over 150 acres of ground. So I think, I'll never forget this. My mom sitting on a five gallon bucket in the utility room and my dad walks in and he says, I bought the ground for this amount of money, a lot of money, over $2,000 an acre. So do the math. Um, and my mom had never known, um, had never known debt. She never had credit cards, credit card debt. So her dad, her her dad, Hootie Baker, Hootie, meant to love it, uh, is short for Hubert. Now, how is Hootie short for Hubert? I'm not exactly sure, but it was short. Well, Hootie had never had, <laughs> he had never had uh, debt himself. Even when he bought a new house, he bought cars, he never had debt. So that's who he was. And that's who my mom was. Well, my dad came home, and he had this, big, uh, you know, idea of ground that he just purchased, my mom didn't share in his oblivious optimism, but my dad didn't get it. Well, I remember my mom sitting there on that five-gallon bucket, and she's like, Wooly! Wooly! How are we ever going to pay for this? <laughs> First off, yes, my dad's name is Wally Wagner. <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. Anyway, so he had to share with her what he'd done and how he was going to how he was going to re remedy it and take care of it. And believe it or not, that ground is still in our family. And this was 1978 that they bought it. It's done very well, and it'll continue to do very well. It's growing crops like left and right. Now I told you about my encouragers, you know, my daughter and my my wife, but these two other guys in the picture with me are great encouragers as well. So every year we'd get together at Christmas time and we'd take these pictures, you know, and this one year in particular, I, I said to him, I, I said, wouldn't it be nice if, um, if I wasn't the only one winking in this picture? Wouldn't it be nice if I wasn't the only one winking in this picture? I said, would you all wink with me next year? Sure, Dad. They're so reluctant. But... They did, and it turned out really nicely. Now, <laughs> some of them wink better than others, but this winking thing has started on a, a real tear. So now, I go around all over the place to my, these conferences, and I speak to people about how they can embrace their own personal blindness, how they can wink with Wagner, so that's what we've done. We begin winking with Wagner, and it happens at conferences all over. You know, there's conferences that have, uh, have embraced it because it's a lot of fun, 
and it helps them to begin to think, well, you know, if this guy next to me, meaning me, knows what makes him unique, and it's not his eye, what makes me unique is my positive personality. And I'm able to share my story with other people in order to help them, help them have better lives. But if this guy next to me knows what makes him unique, and it's not his eye, I wonder what makes me unique. Boom. That's where we started with. We started with what sets you apart. What makes you unique? So I encourage you all to think about that as well. And to wait with me. Much like these people did. I had a great number of people. You know, there was, uh, there was my friend there and another friend at another conference. And then it, it just kind of took off from there. So uh, I now have hundreds and hundreds of different photos of people, of them winking with me. And I've uploaded them to Facebook. But I also have a number of other photos. Well, I, I went to have one photo taken with my mom. So I was at my mom's one day, and I took her a, a blizzard, and a uh, uh, Green blizzard. And she's like, well, this is great, but um, how are you doing? I, I told her I was doing and everything. I said, Mom, can we get a picture together? She's like, sure, Brian. So we took a picture together. And my, my sister actually took the picture. And I looked at it afterwards, I said, Mom, what are you doing? She said, I'm winking. Isn't that what everyone does? <laughs> the matriarch of the Wagners, right there, winking with Wagner. Too funny. <laughs> uh, my mom, I love her, 91 years old. Uh, and then we went on vacation. And I even got uh, my, uh, my driver, the driver of the tour bus, to wait with me and his cousin. Uh, Nathan and Nina. <laughs> so now with COVID, you can't wink with people anymore. You can't get that close to them. So you have to wink without them. So now it's called winking without Wagner. And that's taken on. So I have people that have done that. I even have people that have done that from Oregon. But admit, remember, we were coming back to this. What makes you unique? What sets you apart? We still have time. Tell me what makes you unique. And then we're going to move on. In the chat box. Even though it doesn't say it. Please, in the chat box. Tell me what makes you unique. Being her. Huge vocabulary. Mm. I don't have a huge vocabulary. The ability to not, to not stop talking. <laughs> Special needs parent. I have a tooth that looks like a fang. <laughs> Palm that I bring to other people. Very cool. Energetic. Flexible. Outside the box. I love it. Thank you so much. This is great. Who else? Who else wants to join in? Hmm. Okay. Well, that's all right. I appreciate the one that you that you did respond. I do appreciate that. Well, as I told you, the people in, in Oregon, they even replied, you know, with some winks. So this is my, my new friend here, Kyle Dees. I believe he's the president of Aura, uh, who winked with me. And then even another one winked with me, and this is my friend Lois. She winked without me again, not winked with me, but winked without me. So there are just so many people that have um, began to embrace this, and I, I want to make sure that anyone else that wants to consider winking with me can do that. Now I talked a little bit about wink and the Wink University. So with the Wink University, we have now um, started uh, several programs, but one of those programs is the actual Wink. And do you, would you pull out a Wink, wink workbook? No, you don't have a Wink workbook. Hey, hey, Wes, would you, <laughs> smiling here, would you do me a favor and put in a link to the Wink workbook for everyone? Oh, there it is. Oh, nice job. Wes, you're way ahead of me. So, yes, this Wink workbook is 
becoming very beneficial to help people to, to really start to know what makes them unique, but also how they can really start to embrace that. And embrace that from a sense of, you know, what do you want? Well, what do you want in life? What, what, do you, what is it that is sticking out there for you that you're just not able to obtain? So that's why we created the, the Wink and the Wink Workbook. The W stands for why. Why does it matter what makes you unique? What's important to you? The W again. So for me, my why is being positive to other people, being positive to anybody. Because I want to make sure that I can help other people. And not being positive is a tough place to come from when you want to help other people. So the why is very important. My why is that positive personality. If I can help people with that positive personality, that's really going to be the best. But there's many other people that have other whys. Your why may be you, you want to have um, you want to have a better relationship with your with your spouse. Maybe you want to have a better relationship with your kids. Possibly you you want to go on a diet or you want to lose weight. Maybe you want to work out. You want to exercise more. So understand how you want to do that. Know what you want to do. Write it down. And we're going to work on that later today in our Wink Workshop. Is understanding those things that are important. Is to write those things down. And put them in your Wink Workbook if you can. The I, the I is, well, we talked about how important it is to know what makes us unique. But there's always something that gets in the way. There's so many times where, for my positive personality, I come downstairs and the first thing I want to do is turn on the news. Well, that's not what I should be doing. I, I shouldn't go to the news first thing and start to and start to look at the news. I should get to a point where I am comfortable with just quiet. That's important. So the I is for intentionality. Now, for you, the I may be things like it may be French fries. You know, if you're a diet person. Um, the French fries kind of get in the way of you dieting. Maybe it's a maybe some beer. I don't want to judge. Um, so who knows? There are different things like that that get in the way that distract you from your intentionality, your 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 why, your what. In the end, the end is for a new way of thinking, a new way of looking at life. Well, this office that I have here, it's a virtual office. It's great, but I up until a month or so, I didn't have it, and once I got it, I, I had a lot of lights and um, new lights that were there, but one of them were, was pretty harsh. It was this light right back behind me, back by this um, poster that my daughter had. And uh, she, Connie, says to me, because I'm, I'm looking at the lights and I'm looking at, um, do I need an electrician? Do I need more lights? Do I need a light here? Do I need a light there? What's different? You know, what do I need to do differently? How do I need to approach this differently? And Connie says to me, Brian, why don't you just get a different light bulb? <laughs> I love her. She's awesome. And she just brings me back to, to where I need to be, where, to where I need to understand um, and look at things differently. So that's really important, to have a new way of thinking. But the K, the K is for kinesthetic. It's for taking action. Doing something with what makes you unique. Being intentional with what makes you unique, understanding how important it is to know your why and remember your why and write it down. Write it in the Wink Workbook. That's huge. So, again, that Wink Workbook is going to serve you well. Let's see, what else? That's the K. And that's, that's what the Wink is all about. So, who wants to Wink with me? Who wants to share Wink with me? If you would, I would appreciate it. And send me... Uh, you can find me and send me uh, your post, your your uh, your pictures, whatever. You know, I would be very appreciative of any of that. So thank you very much. How do you make a change? Well, there's a lot of changes that need to be made. You know, we all have a change that we need to look at something different. You know, with uh, with COVID being the way it is, we need to all have had to make a change. We've all had to do these whole compliance things that are going on. You know, we've, there's a lot of rules and regulations around all this, but we've adapted to that, and we've been able to make the change. How, how have you done it? 
I'd be interested to hear more about that. One of the ways I made a change is I wrote a book. Now, this book is based on my story of having brain surgery back in 2011. And I begin to understand that I had more to add, more value to add than what I ever thought. So that's why the name of the book is called Sometimes It Does Take a Brain Surgery. Many of you have already, already have one, and I, I'm so thankful that you've been able to read it and told me about it. There's just so much value that I've, I've gotten from the relationships that have started from there. So if there's more of you that really want to would reach out and say what you think of it, I would very much appreciate that. The only thing, Helen Kelly knew a little bit about being blind. So she said the only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. As we started this conversation, um, this was when, this was when uh, our friend Kim Matrone said to me and said to us, you know, that <clears throat> I worked at the Ohio School for the Blind. At the Ohio School for the Blind, I'm the actual program coordinator. So there's a, a 21st century grant that we have, it's a federal grant, and I work on that grant. I'm actually the site coordinator. So I make sure that the students have know things to do after school so and it helps them with life after school the school day and life after they graduate because they will graduate someday so that's important for us to understand how we can help them well there's many many clubs in this and there's a there's a, a CrossFit club there is a, a cooking club but my favorite club of all you saw this picture once it is the knitting club. The knitting club is really where it's at. It's it's the best because imagine trying to teach visually impaired students how to knit. High school students, nonetheless. <laughs> and if you, any of you have high schoolers or have had high schoolers, you know what well, difficult that can be. Well, first night of uh, knitting club, we went to Joanne Fabrics. Now, I'm sure you have a Joanne somewhere near you. But Joanne Fabrics is one of those places where we go to to get our our our, uh, our uh, sewing supplies, our knitting supplies. Well, we all arrived in the front right corner of the store, and of course the knitting supplies were in the back left corner of the store. So we had to weave our way to the knitting supplies. In I'm going to say this again because I don't think you all caught it. So in the knitting club, we had to weave our way. See? Now, if I was with you, I know you'd all be laughing. <laughs> Thank you. That was my joke for the day. Uh, anyways, we get back there, and, and imagine you're one of, the, uh, one of the ten students that we take. But your sight is better than the most of them, so you end up being the leader. Well, you have to knock and weave your way, and you knock things down, and signs, and all this kind of stuff, but you finally get there. And you get there to the name supplies. The, the leaders of the club wanted to make sure we had the thickest yarn possible. They wanted to make, make sure we had the biggest needles or the, the modified looms that we had. So we had all this, but the students really wanted to make sure they had a certain color of yarn. A certain color of, color of yarn. Why did it matter? What mattered? Because they wanted to knit a scarf for their mom. And their mom's favorite color was blue. That's why it mattered. I've learned so much from these students. <laughs> I can't tell you. Uh, it's been it's been great. But anyway, they, we finished the, the knitting, the uh, the purchase of the supplies, checked out, everything was fine. But I mean, we had to wait another week before we got back to knitting club. Everybody was excited to be in knitting club. I couldn't believe it. Well, I walked in a knitting club where we were that next week, and uh, we were in the original lobby of the school for the blind. So they have a plush leather seats. They have uh, they have you know some folding chairs scattered around, and they have a piano right in the middle of the room. Anyway, so I walk in, and right away the leader says, "Hey, can you help, friend?" Friend was the one that was leading the club. He, he was you. He was leading the club to get back to the next place. I, I said, sure. I 
So I went and sat with a friend, and we talked a little bit, and I said, How do you, what are you trying to do? And he said, he told me, and I called the uh, leader over, and I said, no, I don't want to do this. So she did, she helped us out quite a bit. But you know, I, had, I, I had to then get him to do it. I, I, had, I couldn't tell him, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it for him. I had to teach him. And this is not something that I'm, I'm accustomed to. So, um, as you can imagine, how difficult it was. I mean, for me to just, uh, I had to teach him. I couldn't, I couldn't tell him. I couldn't do it for him. You know, aren't there many times where you have things that you know, it would be so much easier if you just did it yourself? But yeah, you, know, you can't do that. That's not the idea. You have to teach them. You have to teach the employees, teach your your teammates, whatever the case. Well, he he said, well, I have this modified loom, and in the modified loom. There's a groove that goes through it, but I'm going to pull some uh, some uh, uh, yarn or knitting knitting nomenclature out on you. So we had to cast on, yeah, right. I know how to cast on. <laughs> so the casting on had already been done for us, but then we had to lay a yarn or string across the top of that, and then we had to take this hook. He had to take this hook and take it in and put it in a groove. A groove that was on this peg, and then he would have to lift one yarn, one string, over top of the other string, and lift it up over top of the peg, and then he would have done it. I think this took five minutes, but it seemed like an hour, because it just took forever. Well, finally when he did it, I said, friend, you did it. You, you, you made a loop. I said, I did it? I did it. I made a loop. I made a loopy. Just then, someone in the corner of the room says, He made a loop. He made a loopy. And then in the back right, someone else said, He made a loopy. 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 And then the entire room started in with his chant of loopy. 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 It was awesome. Not only had that young man knitted a feeling of success for himself, but he knitted a feeling of success for the entire group. As a speaker, I think of the metaphorical perspective of this. And I think of how that yarn was really like his life. And his yarn was only 18 years long. That's how long he'd been living in a second man's world. And then the, the tools are the, uh, different. Uh, needles or looms that he had in his life. I mean, they were like the events that we taught at the School for the Blind that helped him to get to where he was. And then the loops or the stitches were really what he made out of his life. What he made out of those events that, he, that had shaped him. I think that's pretty cool. But that's just a speaker to me. Anyway, these words, you know, as you can imagine how impressed his mom was that Mother's Day, when she got her gift. It was a scarf. And it was blue. This brought back my grandma's words. Brian, life is not going to turn out the way you planned. So don't be afraid to reimagine your life. Find what makes you unique and use that to make someone else's life better. It's awesome. Absolutely awesome. I'm Brian with one eye. Now go be awesome!